So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. There's a lot of conflicting information out there about what to eat. Are eggs healthy? What about fruit? Should you try a keto diet or go carnivore? Well, my guest today wants to put it all to rest for good. He's Dr. Will Cole. In his new book, The Inflammation Spectrum, he explains why dieting is incredibly personal and exactly how you can find out which foods are triggering your inflammation. Dr. Cole is a functional me medicine expert, the author of the international bestseller, Ketotarian, who we've had him on this podcast before. And Dr. Cole, you're gonna talk about personalized dying, the most important foods to avoid, and the inflammatory habits that might be making our listeners sick. Dr. Cole, welcome back Thanks, to friend. the podcast. Thanks Good to see you again. Back. Likewise. So, now let's start with your new book, The Inflammation Spectrum. One yeah. of the key concepts you explore is something called bio-individuality. Mm -hmm. Big you, word. Yeah, <laughs> that's really too big a word for me. Uh, can you explain to the listeners what that is and why it's so important? Uh, it is a, a fancy word to just say we're all different. We, and that's the heart of what we do. It's the heart of functional medicine. And of course, there's low-hanging truths and there's a lot of commonalities of things that people should do to feel better and things that they should avoid to feel better. But there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of context. There's a lot of spectrum, uh, as, as my, the title of the book implies, of bio-individuality. And we both know this seeing patients what works for one person may not work exactly the same for the next person. There's a lot of variables to consider on a clinical level, seeing patients, but also on a personal level, just living life and wanting to feel good. So I wanted to explore that because I think there's a lot of food confusion and you know, diet disillusionment on, on, a, on a, just a person level when they're on Dr. Google and they're trying to figure out what the heck to do. So I tried to show them what we do in functional medicine to find out what your body loves, what your body hates, because we are all different. So paint a picture for how you go about, you know, looking at that, what individual dietary responses might be to a food. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the subjective and objective way that I would think about this. So subjectively, I started the book out with a quiz that we adapt, I adapted just from questions that we ask patients in functional medicine. So we go through the different systems of the body or what I, uh, the, the picture in the book showing the inflammation spectrum looks at the areas that I see clinically impacting patients the most. So looking at the brain, looking at the hormone system, looking at the detox system, looking at the musculoskeletal system and checking, allowing the reader to check in with their body. How is my cognitive function? Where is my mood? Where is my energy levels? Where is my digestion? For people to see where inflammation, aware dysfunction, where imbalance is impacting them specifically. Um, and at that point, they can find out where they're at on the inflammation spectrum, how inflammation levels are from a subclinical diagnostic, from a questionnaire quiz standpoint. Um, and then the person can say, okay, uh, what can I do about this? And I give specific toolboxes uh, based on functional medicine principles. These are things that the scientific literature shows to be beneficial for specific areas. So let's say the brain area was higher, then I give them things like neurotropics and adaptogens to improve brain function or things that improve BDNF, uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor, as you know. Um, so I, th and then so on and so forth, depending on the different areas on the inflammation spectrum that they're going through. Um, but then there's obviously the diagnostic component too that if you're seeing a functional medicine doctor they can run labs to measure the different components in their biochemistry that may be the most pertinent for them um, and then the third approach in the book is doing an elimination diet to and there's two different tracks. There's a more simple track for people that are lower on the inflammation spectrum and a more advanced the four track. track and the eight track Yes, thank you. I'm a sucker for numbers and play on words. If you need any play on words, I'm your guy. I, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, oh, that would sound good in a book. <laughs> so there's a core four track and eliminate track, as you know. So I wanted a simpler elimination diet approach for people that maybe aren't going through tons of stuff, but just wanna start feeling better. And then people that score higher on the quiz, I wanted to give them a more advanced track 
that uh, enables them to lower inflammation, to center themselves on a physiological level, but also a mental emotional level too. And then reintroduce and see what their body loves and hates. And as we both know, there's gonna be certain foods that we eliminated over that time. They're gonna do fine with when they reintroduce it. And then some people, a lot of our patients, they're gonna have problems with those foods. And they, at that point, they have discernment and knowing, oh, I don't feel good when I have that food. And at that point, it's this transition that we see where it's like, it's not a diet anymore. It's that I love feeling better more than I miss that food. Right. And it's just, an, it's a no brainer at that point for them because they have that food piece and clarity on what works for their body and what doesn't. Yeah, you know, early on in my practice in what I call restorative medicine, but functional medicine is fine. I, I like had, restorative medicine. I had a patient, uh, you know, who had a lot of problems and came back and saw me and I said, so how are you doing? He says, you know, feeling well never tasted so good. <laughs> and, I, you know, it's, it's yeah. I, you know, I congratulate you. You're actually one of the few people in this space, uh, and I count my self in the space that actually sees patients yes. and actually measures the responses of patients of what you ask them to do. Yeah. And you base your advice actually on testing and retesting. Yeah. And you know, I congratulate you. I Thank think you. we can't just say, oh, I read this uh, and that's a really good idea because you and I both know that there are individual responses to, yeah. you know, I think you ought to do this, but then you go, oh, well, you know, that didn't work out so well. Yeah. So you talk about an elimination diet, and that sounds scary to lots of people, and there's lots of variations on the elimination diet. Mm -hmm. So give me, let's, let's, let's go easy here. Give me, give me the four one rather than the eight one. How's that? Uh, yeah, it was good. And then <laughs> thank you for the kind words. I love my passion is seeing patients. And uh, just like you, we wouldn't replace it for, for the world, for sure. Um, and the, so the core four are grains. So that's going to be the gluten-containing grains as, all, as well as the gluten-free grains. Uh, and then the second would be dairy. The third would be added sugar. And four would be high omega-6 oils, these uh, industrial seed oils like canola oil. So that's the core four. So for that plan, we, do, we remove those foods for four, week, for four weeks, um, and we have a step-down chapter as well for people that want to lean into it. Um, and then they go four weeks for the removing them, and then we have a systematic reintroduction that we do to see, let's test it for ourselves. Maybe we feel fine with certain grains, but not with other grains. Maybe we do fine with certain types of dairy and not with other dairy, which you highlight very well in your book, and so on and so forth as you go through these foods that were eliminated. So that's the core four. So do you have any plan for, okay, so I've done that, I feel better, and in fact, most people definitely feel yeah. better. Mm -hmm. What do you like to bring back first? As you know, uh, I, in you know, phase three of my programs, I start reintroducing some lectin-containing foods, mm -hmm. and again, find out you know, what ones you react to and what you don't. Mm -hmm. uh, any you like to start with, have you found through the years? What I recommend for in the book is for patients or the reader, uh, <laughs> patients are all have my context for this, but the reader, uh, for, for them to look on that list and see what they actually miss. Because some people, maybe they don't miss any of those foods and they feel so amazing that they're like, what, I don't even miss these, I don't even wanna bring these back. And then we know, obviously, there are some people that are like, I really miss food X, whatever that, f that food is, and they wanna test that in. So if they wanna bring it all back in, that's fine, but I have the conversation in the book to say, what do you really wanna have? Because these aren't like, necessarily things that you have to have on a regular basis, um, but if you want to, let's enjoy it. People should enjoy food, and if they miss something, let's try to bring it back in. I would say out of those, the core four, uh, I would say the dairy would probably be the most, uh, you know, thing to try back in and start with the full fat dairies. So things like uh, the creams and the uh, butters and fermented dairies like the kefirs and the yogurts. Start with those first and then you can go into, and, and cheeses are a part of that as well, and then after that you bring in the dairy. And I am very specific in the book about what have I seen seeing patients, what are the, generally speaking, the least problematic to the most problematic ending with conventional dairy being the, the, on the low end of that list of being 
what I've seen, what you see too, being the more problematic ones. Yeah, and you mentioned in your book, uh, if you're going to reintroduce dairy, there, there certainly is for some people a difference in their reaction between casein A2 and casein yes. A1 milks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. I appreciate you highlighting that in your book so well, because I think it's hit uh, masses in a way that people weren't aware of it before your book. So I give you credit for that. Well, thanks, thanks. Yeah. And thanks for mentioning it in your book. <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, there are people who will absolutely react to all forms of dairy. And I know you have tests and I have tests now that can identify those people who mm -hmm. even casein A2 is a problem, right. or even whey is a problem, right. uh, which uh, has surprised me through the years mm -hmm. as these better tests have come out. Yeah. And I think some people intrinsically know uh, that they do react to dairy. Many of them don't want to believe that. <laughs> yeah. uh, because, yeah. um, you know, dairy, uh, there's some really cool compounds in, in milk that are morphine-like compounds, and they go right to your brain and go happy, 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 happy. Yeah. Uh, through the years uh, with my work with the ApoE4 gene folks, the quote Alzheimer's gene, a horrible term, but that's what it's called, mm -hmm. these folks uh, really should not have a lot of saturated fats, particularly animal saturated fats, yeah. and yet I used to laugh because I'd say well over 90% of my ApoE4s cheese is their favorite food and it's like kryptonite yeah and i thought of doing a questionnaire what's your favorite food and then you know blindly look at their apple you know four and yeah so there is this component yeah. um and, a, a and that's why quality. i think people want dairy back in their lives totally um yeah. so and but some people are not going to do it no they love their dairy you're right it is a love food it's dairy and grains and i grains. feel like the like coveted Food, food for many people. Well, yeah, because there's so many components in grains, particularly you know wheat, that you know are morphine-like compounds, yeah. and a lot. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, yeah. an elimination diet, uh, I tell people you're going to hate me for two weeks, <laughs> and then you're going to start loving me. Yeah. Um, and I think the more and more I've done this now for 20 years the more I think that it's this addictive quality of mm -hmm. grains, particularly wheat, yes. that they're withdrawing from an addiction. Totally. Do you, you see the same thing? I see the same thing in a lot of people. It's those, I, you know, there's different, the lectins, the wheat germ and gluten and the WGA and these other, they, it's like an opioid sort of opiate type reaction in the body. Um, and so I think it's a, for a certain sect of people, it is the protein sort of drug-like reaction that they're having in the brain. And the, I think the other sect of addictive quality is the sugar. People are addicted to the sugar aspect of it and grains break down into sugar. Uh, and I think that w when they're not getting that kindling on the fire, they get hangry and irritable and they need that fix again. Yeah. So I, I think it's both of those reasons uh, that makes it addictive for some people. And I think there's a third factor that you actually bring up in each one of your sections, and that's the emotional factor, yes. uh, you know, yes. so many of these we, associ we associate eating with family, mm -hmm. with comfort, yeah. and you have an emotional mantra or a mantra in each of your sections. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, you know, particularly coming from your, from your background, an important addition to all this that mm -hmm. most of us don't stress enough. You want, yeah. you want to talk to that for yeah. a minute? I think it's easy that, you know, even I don't stress it enough. I think we all need to be as practitioners and just people should look at the mental, emotional, even spiritual component to that. Cause it's very easy in our space to get caught up in the, the stuff that we see impacting people. We, we deal with the labs, we look at the measurements, we know if how food impacts people. We know the different protocols uh, from a clinical scientific standpoint of how to make people healthy. But then there's this more esoteric, ethereal, mental, emotional, spiritual component that impacts our physiology. So that was another thing that I wanted to uh, talk about during the elimination uh, aspect of the book, because we're not just eliminating foods, because it's not just about foods. And uh, we have to look at stress, we have to look at social media addiction and, and our screen time, we have to look at poor sleep, we have to look at these sort of things that uh, can drive inflammation levels up as well. So 
it's not just about removing things. I also wanted to give people things to do, acts of stillness, acts of peace, acts of things that activate the parasympathetic system to lower inflammation levels. Um, so the mantra is part of that and different practices with that throughout the book people can lean into. Um, so it's definitely important, and I know that you see this too, is that people can have the foods down right, but if they're you know, bur serving their body a big slice of stress every day or they're in a toxic work environment or a toxic relationship, those are things that people need to realize that's impacting their physiology too. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, in the longevity paradox, uh, it's so important when you look at long-lived people that mm -hmm. their social and spiritual practice, their network, yeah. is really you know a huge part of their of their success. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, you can't stress that enough the, of this emotional component to yeah. to all of this. Yeah. Also, there's a fascinating paper you may have seen it you know, that just came out this week on the effect of blue light on mm -hmm. longevity. And it turns out that exposure to blue light uh, from our fluorescent lights, from our cell phone, from mm -hmm. our computer, from our TVs. Uh, now it's done in fruit flies, but hey, fruit flies are a really good model for longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, when fruit flies were exposed to 12 hours of blue light mm -hmm. uh, every day, they live significantly less, less long wow. than fruit flies who were exposed to less than that period of time. Wow. And, and it, they could, even if they didn't see the blue light, but they were exposed to that spectrum, uh, so you don't even have to see it. Just uh, your retinas are exposed to it, and it actually impacts your brain aging. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. I didn't see that study yet. Yeah, I'll send uh, it to you. Yeah, I want to see it. I, we see that, obviously, with patients a lot. That it's impacting their quality of life. It's impacting their sleep. It's impacting their stress levels on so many levels. You know, so I, I do things like blue light blocking glasses. Um, there's different apps you can get download on your phone to prevent that blue light as well. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the apps are out there. Yeah, and people just know, have to use them. Yeah, <laughs> you have to use them. And I just tell everybody, you know, buy a pair of the blue blockers that look like Bono, and you know, you'll be cool <laughs> yeah, watching the like TV. You and you and too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there's, I mean, there's all. It's an easy way. Yeah, it's very easy. And it's something that none of us have really, you know, talked enough about. You're right. And, and you, you talk in your book a lot about these disruptors that I talk about in The Plant Paradox, and I call them seven deadly disruptors, and you've got a few more, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so give me a couple more examples of you know, how disruptors in our environment, in our foods, mm -hmm. have, have impacted us. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you look at human genetics research estimates that our genetics haven't changed in 10,000 years, but look at the time that we're living in, just in our lifetime, how much has changed, just in the last 100 years, how much has changed, a lot of good stuff, a lot of advancements, people are connecting to us around the world, that's amazing, no one's taking that away from that. But the other side of the coin is that there's a growing disparity between our genetics, which remains unchanged for 10,000 years, and the world around us. So I think People in the space of wellness uh, are hopefully um, voices to this conversation of how do we strike a balance with where we're at right now in human history? How can we get the best of modernity without falling prey to these potential pitfalls and looking at our food supply, looking at environmental toxins, looking at what's happening to the soil, looking at technology and the impact that's having on our biochemistry. So I try to not overwhelm people in the book, but give people practical solutions to say you, you don't have to live in a bubble, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to do all the things. You can, and th what I have found is for most people, if they just lean into these things, if they just do the best they can with the access they have, that's within their budget, with what they even have a vessel for to even receive or do right now, uh, just to lean into it, because you, you don't have to be perfect. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, in my first book years ago, I said, do, with, do what you can with what you got wherever yes. you are. Amen. Yeah. And you'll, you'll be okay. In your professional experience, what are the five most inflammatory foods out there? Well, I would say, and all the foods that I'm going to mention here are foods that some people tolerate and some people don't. But generally speaking, what I advise people to avoid at the beginning, especially with the core four, avoid uh, grains for a while 
And obviously, there's subsets to that, and there's a spectrum with grain sensitivities. Uh, and dairy would be number two, added sugar would be number three, and high omega uh, six oils, these industrial seed oils. And if you had to go with five, I would probably say, it's tough, but I would probably say eggs would be on that list. I love eggs, I have nothing, no, I, I, I think it works great for many people. But that would be my top five. I go a little bit more with the eliminate section of the book, and I add in nightshades, uh, and I add nuts and seeds and legumes. Again, all of those eight foods work great for some people, and then you'll see certain foods that don't work great. We're all different, so I want people to explore what they have a tolerance for and what they don't. Yeah, and I think where you're coming from with your history, you, correct me if I'm wrong, you were a vegan for 10 years. Yes, sir, yes, sir. And, um, you are not a vegan anymore, no. and, but you and I both treat a large number of vegetarians and vegans, yeah. many of whom, I think in your experience, particularly some of my vegans are some of the sickest people who come to my clinic. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, thankfully they do, because mm -hmm. at least in the culture I see, most vegans that I see are pasta and grain -itarians. Yeah. Um, and, and beanitarians. Yeah, carbitarians. Yeah, and <laughs> that's unfortunately a recipe for disaster on, on lots of levels. So what was it after 10 years of being a vegan that changed? Was there something in your health or boredom or yeah. what? Yeah, <laughs> boredom. <laughs> I wasn't bored, but you were vegetarian for many yeah, years too. Many yeah, years. so we had a similar story. So. Uh, I was a vegan from my mid to late teens to my mid to late 20s, uh, and it was a whole foods based vegan diet. It wasn't uh, like <laughs> refined carbs all day long. So I was doing it the right way, quote unquote, but I still was predominantly relying on a lot on carb of carbohydrates, whole food carbohydrates uh, for my fuel. And I have autoimmune conditions on both sides of my family. I have a double gene uh, allele for the MTHFR C677T, which is the, basically means my body really uh, isn't at best at, at good at lowering homocysteine levels and methylating, which we need for healthy detox pathways and lowering inflammation levels. Uh, so I noticed over that time I had increased fatigue slowly. This was like incremental. This wasn't overnight, uh, but slowly increased fatigue, increased digestive problems. Uh, I just didn't feel as good as I did when I first started it. So I, without a doubt, I was eating better than the standard American diet, but just because something's better doesn't necessarily mean it's optimal for, for me. Uh, and with my specific genetic SNPs, with my biochemistry, biochem with what I was going through, I evolved my way of eating into a ketotarian approach, uh, which is a mostly plant-centric ketogenic diet, uh, which, which was the title of my first book on this topic. So I, I still was, and still am, still predominantly plant-based, but I'm focusing on healthy plant fats. And then I brought in these non-vegan foods like organic pasture-raised eggs with the egg yolks, with its ama amazing B vitamins and omega fats that are bioavailable, um, and choline, amazing for the brain, uh, and wild-caught fish, um, so fresh seafood, but still predominantly plant-centric. So that's all the way that I eat is ketotarian. And then, as I mentioned in ketotarian, I'll ha when I have grass-fed beef, I'll have that uh, as well, uh, but it's not the main base of my diet. It's just occasionally. So that's that's how I eat now. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a veg aquarian yeah. is what I describe myself now. Yeah. I, we eat we eat primarily vegan during the week, and then usually have wild shellfish or wild fish on on the weekends, yeah. and that, and lots of olive oil, yeah. tons, yeah. tons. We're, we eat basically the same. <laughs> exactly. With an elimination diet, people now talk about, well, uh, Dr. Cole thinks lectins are bad. There's other components of plants that are bad that you go into, uh, the phytates, the saponins, uh, that are all a plant defense system yeah. against being eaten. And I think, thankfully, more and more people are realizing that mm -hmm. plants don't particularly want to be eaten. Although you and I both think that people should eat plants, but know who's good for you and who isn't. Yeah. And I, I, one of your points I think is very well taken, and I talk about it in my book, but it often gets missed. People with irritable bowel or gut issues, uh, raw plants, even healthy raw plants, yeah. leaves, 
Yeah. Uh, cruciferous vegetables yeah. are really mischievous for people uh, initially with leaky gut, with IBS. And you talk about this. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So I, I, even these lower lectin foods, these more um, you know, generally tolerated foods for people with digestive distress in the GI gastrointestinal like digest digestive system toolbox, it's cooked vegetables, even pureed soft cooked vegetables, lower FODMAP cooked vegetables. I'm just being specific on the things that I've seen work for people. Just to basically almost pre-digest it, break it down for the body in soups and stews and soft cooked foods. So when you eat it, you're not having the, the problems uh, that people are seeing with salads and people are seeing with vegetables that are even not raw but are not cooked enough. So yeah, it's definitely a conversation in the book because of seeing patients. Yeah, exactly. And you know, you and I, I guess if we didn't see patients, we'd say, oh, you know, boy, the more green, the better, and raw is, is great. I was a raw foodist for nine months and actually did extremely well with it. Uh, but it's unsustainable. Um, you do lose a lot of weight. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, but yeah, we see, I see so many people that you know the raw food component is is really hard to deal with initially now yeah. eventually once you kind of get the gut healed then i'm the first person to say let's get yeah. more of this raw stuff into you yeah. but yeah i tell them you got to nuke this stuff uh <laughs> yeah. to you know, put them in the pressure cooker yes. make it make it just mush and your idea of blending these things into a soup uh, these things make great Soups, yeah. and we, we forget, you know, soups used to be a mainstay of everybody's diet. Mm -hmm. And so make soups out yeah, of these make things. Soups, especially in the colder months, yeah. um, people can do it. And in the summer months, like a gazpacho, like a cold. Yeah, cold soup. Yeah, yeah. or in Palm Springs, it's always hot. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice right now, come on. Uh, no, so I think it's important. So the ultimate elimination diet, some people say, is the carnivore diet. What say you as a former vegan? Yeah, so you would think the author of Ketotarian, like the mostly plant-based ketogenic, why, like why would I ever like the, the carnivore diet? But seeing patients, I think there's a clinical place for it. I think there's a practical application place to consider that um, for some people. So we, when we see patients that are having uh, reactions to just about everything, uh, a lot of the plant foods, they are causing problems. They've, we've, we've eliminated this and this and this, and they're still having symptoms. They're better than they were, obviously. Uh, I'm not saying that they're still where they're at. They're light years better than they used to be, but they still aren't where they need to be. And at that point, we lean into what I would consider a clean, nutrient-dense, well-formulated carnivore diet, where we are not having dairy during the time. We're not even having eggs oftentimes, maybe egg yolks. Um, and focusing more on organ meats and wild caught fish and being sort of a pescatarian and organ meat centric uh, carnivore diet. Now, this is not meant to be forever and ever. The, this is to downregulate the inflammatory cascades to allow the body to start to heal and calm down. So you can start leaning in those soft cooked pureed vegetables, the pressure cooked vegetables, the soups and the stews and lean in from there. So I do use it as an elimination diet approach for people that need it but it's not meant to be long term. And you mentioned, and as I mentioned in the book, the APOE people uh, sh need to be mindful of that. Uh, that's not, and that's a, a catch 22. So if they're dealing with these food reactions, but they have these gene alleles, we have to have a conversation of what makes sense for people um, because uh, that amount of saturated fat, and we both know obviously that grass fed beef isn't just saturated fat, but right. they're going to be getting more than they used to be probably doing this protocol. So that may not be right for them. Okay, come on. So why <laughs> wouldn't this be a long-term diet? Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the <laughs> interesting thing. I, I think that some people can get away with it longer than others. I have my concerns from a microbiome diversity standpoint and largely uh, our microbiome, all the trillions of bacteria in our gut, they get their diversity or they get their strength and their robust vibrance from plant fibers. And that's what the research shows. That's what the best data is around it. And I would say from a practical application standpoint, that's what I see too. So in the short term, it can have some clinical benefits, some health benefits. Longer term, what does the end look like? And 
look, I mean, most people aren't going to want to do this long term. It's just not sustainable. There's not much variety. So how do we make this wellness thing realistic and practical and sustainable for this, the average person, not the biohacker? Maybe the biohacker people in the carnivore world love it and they thrive on it. That's fine. That's not necessarily um, every man and woman out there. Yeah. I think that's I think it's forgotten in all this discussion. Yeah. And uh, I think you and I both see in our practice that an elimination diet, however we describe that, definitely lowers markers of inflammation. Yeah. But uh, the fact that that's a long-term you know, solution is, is not compatible with the microbiome research that yeah. you know, is well published. Mm -hmm. uh, this microbiome has to be diverse and it likes plant sugars and plant fibers that we can't digest. Mm -hmm. And as I write about in my book, and I, people still have not embraced this, but it's okay, it's published stuff that this weird sugar molecule in beef, lamb, and pork, new 5 gc mm. produces an auto antibody response to the vessel wall in humans. That's and a great point. Yeah, you know, yeah. I just don't think this is a long-term solution. And you know, I'm a boy from Omaha, Nebraska, and you know, it just pains me to tell people this. Yeah. But I agree with you. I think some people we really, you know, have to kind of go hardcore and get a lot of plant materials out of people. Um, but then once you get the gut you know, yeah. healed, and yeah. I've never yet seen that you can't. Sometimes it surprises me how long it takes. Totally, yeah. When I started this 20 years ago, I thought anybody's gut could be healed in two weeks. <laughs> and uh, boy, was I naive. Yeah. Uh, but I've found uh, most of the time looking at these markers of leaky gut, the longest it's ever taken is nine months. Um, mm -hmm. You have an op opinion on that? Yeah, and I, th I think this is almost the spectrum of healing, is that we have these benchmarks of time where I want to be seeing things moving in the right direction, meaning decreased frequency, decreased intensity of whatever symptom we're talking about, whether that's digestion or fatigue or any other inflammatory symptom. <clears throat> now, some people move really quickly, some people move really slowly. Uh, but even the people that are moving slowly, they're still moving in the right direction. And we have to check in both subjectively, how are these people doing? Like, uh, I love these people by the time I'm, I'm, I'm spending months with them and I really want the best for them uh, and checking in with where they're at. But also objectively, we need to be seeing these biomarkers move. So I agree with you, six, nine months, we want to see things cons considerably better, markedly better. But I don't think it s stops there. I think that 18, 24 months, really getting to the place of what I would say at optimal function, close to optimal function, getting as, better, as much as they, allowing their body the time it needs to get as better as it can be, as good as it can be for them. Um, and I think there's different studies to show that, that the, when you're talking about the gastrointestinal system healing and downregulating these inflammatory cascades, it can take up to two years for some people. And again, I'm not saying they have to wait that long to feel better. Right. But it's that, okay, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm better than I was, but I'm not where I need to be. And then we can continue to move in the right direction. Yeah, uh, I just sent in an abstract this week to the American Heart Association Lifestyle and Epidemiology meeting. And I, I can't tell you the results, of course, but what's exciting is using these new markers of, of leaky gut and also looking at reactivity to such things like gluten or the mm -hmm. components of gluten. We found over the course of about nine months that not only does leaky gut seal when you take away, for instance, lectin-containing foods, you take away A1 mm -hmm. dairy, nightshades, etc., mm -hmm. but the reactivity of the immune system mm -hmm. to these components goes down. Wow. And it's actually really exciting yeah, it that, exciting. Yeah. and part of the thing that was actually surprising to me is that the microbiome re-educates the immune system. Mm. That it's okay yeah. that these things, we've, we're taking care of it now. Yeah, crosstalk. Yeah, yeah. and the, and the crosstalk that yeah. happens. And the fact that when your gut is no longer leaking, obviously lectins and LPSs and bacterial particles and other food particles aren't coming across to activate the immune yeah, system. Yeah, I love that. But the fact that the immune system, actually the immu immunoglobulins no longer, they've forgotten 
that they're interested in these yeah. things. I can't wait to see that it's study. It's really exciting. It's really like, again, I'm like a kid in a candy yeah. store, because yeah. it's like, holy cow, I didn't think this was possible. Yeah, I mean, this is such cutting edge stuff, but people are really looking for answers and tools to empower their life to see the, not only the clinical and the anecdotal stuff, but now seeing the mechanisms and what the body's capable of doing. We're living in exciting times for sure, and you're leading the way. For well, sure. Hippocrates led the way. All disease begins True. in the gut, right? Yeah. <laughs> he knew something. I guess How did that guy know that? That's he's why he's the father of modern medicine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You talk about inflammatory habits that people have. Yeah. What are three inflammatory habits that our listeners can try and change today? Mm. So one would be prolonged sitting. You know, it's been said. <laughs> It's been said sitting is the new smoking, but, you know, I think it depends on the person, right? But For those of you who are listening, we both stood up. <laughs> uh, but, so, does that mean you can never sit? Of course not. But it's move. Get up and move. So many people are sedentary, and we know this, right? But let's put it into practice in simple ways. So, if it's getting up and stretching, getting a standing desk, getting out and just walking on your breaks, and moving around, it, it improves productivity, improves cognitive function, it lowers inflammation levels. So I think uh, that's one. I would say having a uh, healthy, balanced relationship with technology would be number uh, two. And that's going to be, what does that mean? That means setting boundaries, like maybe using those apps on, the, on our smartphones that shows you screen time or locks you out and don't like go back don't try to override the app to allow you back in hold that thought because i want to check this <laughs> <laughs> i'm picking up my phone <laughs> for those listening yeah so we both from a blue light standpoint and a visual stimulation standpoint and uh the fomo inducing content on social media of this sort of uh, i'm not enough comparison this sort of stress anxiety response that people are having I mean, a lot of the times in the day, people check their phones. The research is staggering how much we check our phones. So that's going to be, and then we get practical ways to solve that. I mean, there's many ways to solve it, but uh, just to have some checks and balances with technology. And three, I would say look at the products you're using in your home. Look at the products you're using on your skin. Our skin is our largest organ, and it absorbs a lot of what we put onto it. So. Resources like the Environmental Working Group or the EWG yep. with yep. those Skin Deep uh, initiatives and other initiatives uh, to educate yourself on these things that are largely unregulated. We don't have a lot of uh, protection as far as consumers are concerned, and there's a really lack of education as far as consumers are concerned because they're just going getting the shiny bottle that has good branding. But let's actually find out what's on the label and what's in it. Yeah, there are so many not only toxins, but endocrine disruptors in our common household products, in our skin products, yeah. in most of our sunscreens. Yeah. Uh, and there's good research that these things are absorbed, like yes. you point out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we just don't know. The average consumer, be wary. Yeah. Okay, so what research has you excited right now? We've kind of talked about some of this. And what comes next for you after this book? Uh, well, what comes next for me is I'm back to seeing patients <laughs> in a couple of days. So I'm here for book launch right now, but I, my day job, as you know, as you, as same for you, is, is consulting patients online primarily uh, via webcam. Uh, and then just getting back into seeing patients and uh, focusing on my clinic. And that's basically it. And I'm hosting a podcast, uh, Goop Fellas, which... Yeah. Uh, is exciting and we're gonna have you on and oh, uh, yeah so that's really been hanging out with my kids and my wife and doing family stuff how old are the kids 13 and 10 oh you poor guy <laughs> I, br I brought my son out with me ah. for this trip so he's hanging out with with me on this trip very good very good so how do people find you and the new book the inflammation spectrum Everything's at drwillcole.com. That's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E.com. And yeah, on Instagram, it's at drwillcole too. And anywhere where books are sold? Yeah, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Indie Books, all that stuff. Great. All right. Thanks again for, for coming on. Me, Appreciate it. See you. Good to see you. 
Now, don't go away, because we have an audience question, and I think both of us are going to chime in on this one, because I think this is right up everybody's alley. Okay, uh, Jean-Marc Halbut asks, So, Dr. Gundry, how do the French who eat bread at every meal do it? Is the bread in France different, and would it contain less lectins than ours in the U.S.? That's a great question. I've, I've actually talked a lot about this uh, before, but um, you want to take it first? I could take it okay, first. Okay, you take it first. I think first. we may say similar things, yeah. but uh, I see this a lot with patients. They'll go on vacation and they will say, I, this fine. I had this baguette, I had this bread, no problem. And they had the pasta, no problem. I think it's a mixture of a few things, just my opinion from clinical experience. I would say it has to do with the quality of the grains in Europe versus the United States. That when you look at the hybridization of the wheat supply, which you talk about very eloquently, and the glyphosate spraying on the grains as well. And I think there may be, at least for some people, a component of they're just less stressed on vacation and the impact that stress has on their biochemistry too. So I think it's those three factors. And uh, that's, they can't get away with that when they come back home. Yeah, they really can't. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I see this all the time. First of all, you know, the, the French and Italians and Swiss uh, aren't stupid. They don't have whole grain baguettes. They don't have whole grain pasta. Well, they do now in the tourist places, but it, they just cringe that they actually have to serve this stuff because uh, <laughs> who in the world would do this? So they're really removing a lot of the lectin components in, in wheat. Uh, I, the more and more I look at this, I do think that Roundup or glyphosate is a big factor in this. Um, I just have a, a patient who had horrible psoriasis, a young woman from the, the Bay Area, who we got her psoriasis gone, everything's good, off of her immunosuppressants. She and her husband went to Italy for a month, and she said, you know, we are going to enjoy ourselves, and they ate pasta, they ate bread. Um, she did not flare, and she said, great, you know, I am cured, and came back to the Bay Area, and within a week, you know, was eating the pizzas and the pastas and the breads, flared, and, wow. and you know, she called me on the phone, she said, what the heck, and I said, well, it's different it really mm -hmm. is yeah. and it's you know right now luckily there are movements in Europe to to ban glyphosate completely uh, Belgium has a law Germany will have a law that takes effect next year but it is legal in Europe now thanks to Bayer so just mm -hmm. we got to be careful out there yeah yeah but it is different and I talk about it in all my books of people who have gotten in remission of their autoimmune disease or their IBS and then go back home uh, to Poland or Hungary and eat their traditional foods, think they're cured, hmm. come back, boom. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's yeah. so common that we see that, for sure. Yeah. All right, so that's it for the Dr. Gundry podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.